welcome back to my channel. Thank you all for your comments on my previous video. This is kind of um, a little extension on that, I guess, as I've been reading um, some other articles that I've come across, uh, which I'd just like to share with you. The first article, which is quite short, um, is from a children's development specialist, um, .co.uk. And it says, is autism too broad a term? And the article was published in November 2020. So it's, it first of all says that autism is actually interpreted very differently by different people. It's not the case that the term autism has a kind of uh, unanimous kind of uh, understanding. Uh, people do interpret it um, according to different... Um, criteria. So for some people, also simply refers to those who are socially awkward and whose interests are narrow. You know, anyone who's a bit, anyone who's like that as all, well, often designated autistic, regardless of whether or not they have a diagnosis or not, which is rather suspect if you ask me. Um, other people, for other people, the term autism refers to a disorder which severely impacts on quality of life, which is far more than just socially awkward with narrow interests. Now, uh, in relation to the previous article that I talked about, um, to do with autism being too potentially too broad a term, um, uh, an autistic advocate called Tom Clements, who uh, has a a brother, an autistic brother, who has autism plus um, learning disabilities and I think he's min either minimally verbal or can't speak, I, I, I'm not entirely sure, but he's very disabled anyway. Um, Tom Clements has our, Tom Clements is really against the neurodiversity movement, by the way. Um, I think he comes at it from a slightly different perspective to me. Um, but yeah, he's very against the neurodiversity movement and... He, he argues that maybe we should divide severe and mild autism into two separate conditions and to reintroduce Asperger's syndrome. He says there should be an important differentiator between the mild and severe variants. He argued that in The Guardian. Um, I suppose the first question there would be how, uh, what metric would you use to divide severe and mild autism into two separate conditions? What metric would you use? Because it's not, it's not as simple as it sounds. Um, and if you're going by the assumption that verbal people with autism, people who can talk, are therefore mild, that suggests to me a rather retrograde step. Because, just because obviously someone can talk, and is highly verbal does not by any means does not in any way mean that their condition is mild or that they're not that disabled that's what some people erroneously think but that's not actually the case obviously though like there are degrees of disability and someone who can't talk and who's very who needs 24 7 care who needs someone to be with them all the time you can you can't even be left on their own you know um is obviously considerably more disadvantaged than someone who doesn't have that, obviously. But that doesn't take away from the fact that someone who doesn't need 24-7 supervision, it doesn't detract from the fact that they can still be very disabled in their own right, in a different way. Um, so... Yeah, so how do you... So dividing, so so creating a sort of binary split between severe and mild autism, I'm not sure, it's, it's not quite as simple as all of that, because you might create a line, like one line, and you might have severe autism on one side and mild autism on the other, but that suggests that the mild autism, that the autism that isn't in a severe bit, is mild, but that isn't, they're not, just because something isn't, Severe, severe, <laughs> doesn't mean it's mild. Um, so there needs to be a better way of, like, doing that. Um, 
you know, there can be different types of severity. Different types of severity which can be mutually exclusive, which is part of the problem with the whole spectrum idea because that's kind of like along one line. Um, obviously, it has been extensively criticised. Um, and I think that's one of the few areas where the neurodiversity movement has potentially done some good work. I, obviously, I'm very, very critical of the neurodiversity movement, uh, as you know. But I do appreciate the good work they've done where it's been done. Um, and I guess that is one instance of that, is that drawing attention to the fact that autism isn't like a one-line sort of thing. You know, it's not one-dimensional. Um, but I disagree with them in saying that we should do away with, like, descriptors of severity completely because I do think they're important when people are like needing support and quite clearly some autistics do need more support than others but it's it's kind of like the way I guess it's the way you go about that and that is obviously very contentious and um something that doesn't have any easy answers really but I'm not I'm not sure that a simple binary split between severe and mild is necessarily the right way to go about it. I'm not sure. I mean, that just seems a little bit too arbitrary, if you ask me. And this idea that those who are... Just because someone can speak, you know, and is highly verbal, like I say, it doesn't mean that they're mild. You know, you could you could be able to talk really, really well, like I'm doing now, um, and not have and not have the foggiest idea of how to interact with people to form normal human relationships not have the executive ability to go out to work and earn a living, um, have crippling anxiety, like extreme avoidance, and not be able to do normal adulti ad certain adulting tasks without a lot of help. Um, but because you can talk and because you can do certain things on your own and because you don't need someone around you all the time, people then assume you're mild, but clearly you're not if you can't adult in those normal ways and that can make you very vulnerable if your support network isn't there or you don't even have the skills to access a support network um so it's a different type of severity uh, obviously it doesn't detract from the fact that some people have are, are even more disadvantaged because it's all relative but at, at the same time doesn't take away from your own problem so there needs to be ways of talking about this without trivializing the needs of people whose condition is anything but mild but at the same time creating understanding that um, I guess and I guess this does come back to the whole issue of a broadening of the autism spectrum to include those who don't have any clinically significant impairment I mean if autism by definition includes everyone who has a clinically significant impairment regardless of whether or not they can talk then maybe you wouldn't need to have this kind of um division of autism because autism would be immediately understood that oh someone's got diagnosis of autism they're needing a lot of support regardless of what that support might entail but because we're now broadened the term out to such an extent that people like Melanie Sykes are getting diagnosed um you know and people who basically can forge a whole life for themselves like without any without relying on support at all like they literally have it all sorted they're basically neurotypical in their ability to lead completely normal lives because that is happening increasingly, that's where this is becoming an issue. But if autism was like literally reserved as a diagnosis to all those people who basically need significant support to get by in life, like, you know, to be able to do normal stuff, like, you know, if they do work, they would still need support to do it sort of thing. Or like they need, basically they are significantly disabled. Um, if that was clear and if autism was reserved for people with really quite significant social handicaps and executive handicaps then yeah you wouldn't really need to talk about dividing it up so that's the thing as well but it seems like we've gone too far now like I, I, I think maybe yeah that's why we need to create separate conditions um, and then if we have separate conditions it won't detract from anyone's needs but it will make it clear that if you have X, Y, and Z condition that you will obviously have a high support need regardless of whether or not you can talk or not. I don't know. We need to do something anyway. But um, I disagree though with um, Tom Clements' idea that, um, oh yeah, he says here, he says this is what I disagree with. He says that, well, I both agree and disagree. He says that contemporary autism discourse is skewed in favour of the verbally able. So that is true, that bit is true. 
contemporary autism awesome discourse is skewed in favour of the verbally able. That is very, very true. Um, and obviously, that's kind of inevitable, I guess, because obviously, like, you know, language is a really powerful asset. If you have language, you're going to be heard, uh, obviously. Um, and obviously, those who can't talk, you know, don't have that ability and are obviously going to require their advocates, their parents and their carers to do that talking for them. Um, but the idea that, but I don't like his idea that just because someone is verbally able that they're not disabled. I just think that's really kind of like binary and um, clearly that's not the case at all. Um, obviously being able to talk is a massive asset and you obviously are a relatively advantaged if you can talk vis-a-vis -vis someone who can't, obviously. Um, and I'm super glad I can talk. Because um, obviously if someone can't talk, they're really, really vulnerable because they can't even let anyone know, like, they can't express themselves through language. That must be, you know. So obviously I'm glad I can talk, uh, and very well. It's kind of something I'm good at. Um, but just because you can talk, it doesn't mean you're not disabled. That's this really old-fashioned view that I don't know where it came from in society or history. This idea that I think it must be something to do with the fact that in the West, language is valued. It's valued in our education system and everywhere. You know, verbal prowess is valued. So if you can talk, if you have good verbal abilities, it's assumed you have it all sorted. But that's a very kind of like an, that's a very old-fashioned view, and uh, it needs to change. Um, and then obviously, like, people then don't realise how disabled you are. They think, oh, you can talk. They see you as really able. They think you can do all the adulting stuff. They think you don't have a communication problem because you can talk. But obviously, talking is just one type of communication. Um, I can talk, but I still struggle with communication. But because I can talk so well, um, people think I'm really good at communicating. But, like, yeah, I am good at communicating like I am here on YouTube, that form of communication. But that's just one form of communication. There's a lot... Uh, the type of communication I struggle with is social communication, which involves, you know, like, um, essentially reading the lines, reading other people, non mainly a lot of it is non-verbal stuff. Um, but also... Yeah, so basically people, people don't understand it. They underestimate that because of the fact I have good verbal skill. Uh, okay, so I'm going to move over to video number two now to carry on talking about this. So, moving over to video number two.